Okay, you all, let's admit everybody. I'm going to disable the waiting room. One, two, three, testing. Go for it. Bonsoir tout le monde. Et puis bienvenue. Um, so today's uh, workshop is sustainable political advocacy. We're very fortunate to have uh, two very dynamic speakers. Um, first is Ellen Yarbrough. He is the coordinator of the Haiti Advocacy Working Group, or HOG, and he is a uh, organizer um, with the United Episcopal Church. Um, he has lived several years in Haiti and he has done all kinds of workshops like this one for the organizations that he works for. Um, so this is, um, he said he's gonna have a new a twist on this because uh, this year, 2021, for those of us working in Haiti, we don't, I don't need to say that it has been a very, very challenging year for us. Um, and I don't need to say that 2020 was also a challenging year. So um, he's added the, uh, the component of uh, self-care to this. Um, and then after this, we will have the good fortune to have Representative Ayanna Presley, who represents Massachusetts' seventh district, which includes Boston. And she is the co-chair and co-founder of the Haiti Caucus. I will introduce her when she is able to come. And um, for those who are, this is our first time coming, uh, the Haitian Zionist Association is an organization that's been around for 33 years. We're very happy to be able to link arms with advocacy organizations like the HOG. Uh, this particular uh, workshop is part of Advocacy Day and we have several co-sponsors, including the, the, uh, the HOG, Haiti Response Coalition, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti the North American Congress in Latin America, the Kimberly Green Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Florida International University, um, and uh, the American Jewish World Service. So uh, very excited to have such a dynamic team together. Um, also, um, the Green Family Foundation had a great role to play in supporting this year's conference overall. We have, have other sponsors that we will acknowledge tomorrow as well. This is a free event open to the public. Uh, this this is in advance of the, the conference that is uh, for members. So if you're interested, I will put a link in the chat how to register for the conference that starts tomorrow. So um, the theme for the conference is New Lapi Red Toujou, embodying new practice, new praxis. Um, this is a moment where we, um, we have to be involved uh, in raising our voices. Um, so today's advocacy day is, is giving us the tools to engage policymakers. So we're very happy that Ali Arbro uh, and Representative Ayanna Presley are gonna be available to facilitate this conversation. There is translation available. Um, so if you look at uh, your, if you have the full screen, interpretation should be one of the op options. Uh, this is gonna be in English and it will be live translated into Creole. So, sous ta besoin de traduction, t'as pu garder petit bouton en bas qui dit interpretation, et puis cliquez là on a, et puis on a écouté Creole haïtien pendant mon a parlé anglais. Um, so without further ado, I want to thank you all for coming um, and thank Alan Yarbo um, for what's going to be a very, uh, I hope to be uh, very useful and I know it will be a very, a very enlightening uh, and timely and necessary conversation about how to, how to be more effective when we're raising our voices for, for hating. So Alan. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate it. And it's really great to be with you all uh, today. I'm grateful for the chance to share uh, some of my work with the Episcopal Church, uh, which is primarily doing advocacy training um, and civic engagement um, with the Episcopal Church in the United States. Um, but in that work, also uh, chair the Haiti Advocacy Working Group, um, as, as Mark mentioned, which focuses on advocacy to the US government in particular um, regarding our foreign policy to Haiti. 
Uh, so I hope today's discussion is helpful uh, and clarifying for you on uh, what advocacy is and can be, um, how you can navigate it um, and be a part of, you know, trying to encourage change um, in the U.S. government, you know, policy making in particular. Um, and, and so I hope to, uh, and then, you know, toward the end of, our, of my time before Representative Presley comes on, uh, I hope to have time for Q&A um, and qu for questions. So if you have questions as you go um, along, please put them in the chat um, and then we will get to them um, toward the end. Um, to start, you know, I do want to invite you all to um, put in the chat, if you wish, uh, what do you understand advocacy to be? What does advocacy mean to you? Um, it could be short answers, long answers. I'll keep speaking as you all are, are entering that. Um, but I think it's important to uh, acknowledge some terminology around advocacy before we get going so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, so I see Alyssa said lobbying uh, in order to change policies, um, policy change, public awareness. Um, you know, there are a lot of different aspects um, to advocacy, meeting with representatives, supporting and influencing decisions. Um, but, and I think there's a narrower definition of advocacy that I understand to be particular to relationship building and messaging with government officials. It can certainly include education and awareness for the general public. It can certainly have relations to what I would call activism, um, like protests and marches, um, public events. Um, those are critical elements to all of our work um, in pursuing justice. Um, I think you know this fairly well. Um, but I do want to narrow the scope um, of today's training um, to that advocacy that deals with relationship building with elected officials. Um, I see a couple of other, another comment from, from Angela here, working within existing power structures to make change. Um, I think that is pretty accurate. Um, it means both holding government officials accountable, hopefully. Um, it also means being a resource and being helpful for government officials as they navigate complex you know, realities like the reality in Haiti um, and the US foreign policy toward it. Um, so there is an element of uh, just simple encouragement or urging of government officials to act in a particular way, but there's also an exchange where we can ask, how can we be helpful? How can we come alongside you um, in our personal capacities with the organizations we're affiliated with, how can we be a part of the solutions as well? Um, and that's really critical to, yeah, I see the words from Cindy, it's critical to empowering policymakers with information uh, that can help them in that, those decisions, um, that can help convince them to see, you know, what we're wanting them to do as, as the right way to move forward or the best way to move forward. Um, so with that introduction, um, I hope that that clarifies sort of the space in which you know advocacy takes place. Um, and I want to move to share my screen for the rest of my speaking time here. You should be able to see uh, Central Plateau here. Um, so sustainable political advocacy. Mark mentioned that this is sort of a twist on uh, my, my standard uh, training that I do for advocacy and it is. And it's, it's a recent one because people get tired um, even within the context of Haiti, um, you know, with only one country in the world, only one particular aspect of, of U.S. government policy, uh, there are a lot of different areas we could be focusing on. There are a lot of stresses. There are stresses around governance. Uh, there's stresses around insecurity. Um, but then you have things that have kind of been out of the news, uh, but are still very relevant, like this, um, uh, food insecurity, um, climate change in the environment, uh, the justice sector, um, and how to, to address, you know, uh, criminal justice reform, not just in the U.S., but in the context of, of Haiti. Um, there are all sorts of different things that can overwhelm us. Um, and so how do we navigate uh, our own engagement in that? How can we do that successfully? How do we make sure we're effective in this work and not just overwhelmed. Um, and so that's the angle that I'm bringing in here and over the course of the, the conversation and what I'll share, hopefully you'll get some specific tools uh, on what you can do uh, in this process. 
So this slide here, you know, I, I, I love this picture of, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, because it really is about bringing one's whole self uh, into this work, um, remem remembering to not remembering to 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 emphasize the aspects of our lives uh, that bring joy, that bring excitement, that bring complexity to relationships that are not just driven by, you know, what are the injustices and, and how can we how can we address them? Um, and I think bringing our whole selves into relationship is an act of vulnerability, you know, strength and, and preservation. Um, I think this picture of Martin Luther King speaks to me to this point because there's so many narratives about, uh, about him, about his life, about his work, uh, different narratives from when he was alive doing that work, and those narratives have even changed since then. Um, some quite negative, uh, others quite positive of his work. But I think in general, those narratives often miss the whole person. Um, the fact that there is a human there, right? And this image to me is a reminder of that, um, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was, was a person. Um, he brought his whole self in, into life because that's what we do. And I think it's important to keep that in mind um, in our own work. So what do I mean by these three terms? It's an act of vulnerability, bringing our whole selves in um, because we're imperfect. Uh, we lack knowledge, we make mistakes, uh, we have privileges in different ways, uh, different experience, uh, different trauma, and that can be vulnerable for us to bring into, uh, into this work. Um, it's an act of strength uh, because it takes certain conviction to raise a point, to say this is what we should be doing. Um, but it also takes humility to say, I don't know it's unclear what the right way forward is, but this is the perspective that I have. This is the information that I can bring. Um, and it takes curiosity to be with people who are being themselves. Um, that's, that's really an act of strength, in, in, in my opinion. And then I think it's also an act um, of preservation, uh, in part because we're being true to who we were made to be. Um, I do the presentation in the context of the church, so I actually... I, didn't edit the sentence, um, but in the context of, of, of uh, our church conversations, at least, uh, we're being true to who, who God made us to be, and we're extending that to others, uh, and that's a really critical piece to this work. Two other points in relation to bringing our whole selves in and the connection to policy advocacy uh, are these two critical things that I see people often forget. Um, the first is that politics requires relationship. Um, politics is effectively just that. There are politics within an organization um, as an organization seeks to make decisions. There are politics within the U.S. government as the U.S. government seeks to make decisions. Uh, and there are politics within the international community as they make decisions together and navigate these cross-cultural international contexts. Um, and then the second is something that you all, all of us, I think, know very well, but we can forget sometimes, is that policy issues impact real people. Somewhere along the line, even if a particular issue doesn't impact you directly, it's impacting someone. There's someone out there that, that cares about it, that is acting for justice, because those actions in and of themselves are an act of self-preservation and self-care. Um, so policy require, uh, politics requires relationship and policy issues impact real people. So there are two action tips that may uh, be a bit surprising that I want to talk about in, a, in the context of advocacy. Um, and the first of those is rest. Um, it's actually really critical that we take time to step away if we can from some of this work. Um, to replenish ourselves, to remind ourselves of those parts of our, our lives um, that we may not be tending to. What does bring us joy? How do we connect with other people uh, in, in very human ways? Are we taking time to go play pool? Um, are we taking time to, to go dance, to cook a, a good meal? Are we taking time to rest and step back? 
Um, and again, in the um, in the context of, of the Episcopal Church, um, we have a, a sort of a way of life um, or, or a, a rule of life, if you will. Um, and part of that rule of life, one of the seven components is rest. Um, and we ground that thinking actually in the, the practice and theology of the, of the church. Um, so recognizing everyone here may not be you know, religious, um, I still think it can be helpful to highlight this sort of backing. There's something really core here that's not unique to Christianity, um, but at least from the Christian tradition, you know, we have the creation stories um, where God established the creation, you know, the, this pattern of going and returning, of creating, and then having time for labor and time for rest. Uh, and so in that, there's this invitation to leave time for restoration and wholeness of ourselves um, within our bodies, within our minds, um, within our souls, and within our communities. Um, and I think there's a piece here that resonates both in a religious context, if that speaks to you, but also secularly, where this type of action requires a lot of trust. Um, it requires that, if again, from a religious context, trust in God, you know, to see us through, to be supportive of us in this journey that we are on. I think from a secular context, it provides trust in our communities and our relationships, um, that we are working on these issues together. Um, and moving them forward together. After rest, uh, I want to talk about joy um, and the importance of joy. Uh, I think some of you all who may be based in the US, although I, I see it in, in Haitian social media at times too, um, but there's a concept of, of black boy joy um, or black girl, black girl magic I've seen. I've also seen black girl joy, but um, that's an example to me of where it's important to remember our whole selves. I know I'm repeating that, that phrase, but that it's so critical, it can be a part of this justice work. Um, and it's not something that takes away from it. It actually can enhance our ability uh, to do it. Um, another sort of figure that I, I like to point to and, and admire um, is Kendrick Lamar. Um, and I think he speaks to this um, in, um, and the song the, uh, uh, from, from which I pulled the lyrics on the screen, um, you know, where he, he sings about, sings and raps about really difficult, heavy topics and heavy reality. But he also speaks about, we're going to be okay. Uh, we may be weak, but we're going to be okay. Um, and sticking with the, the religious context that I come from, I really loved this Vanity Fair cover um, of him in particular. Um, and the title, The Gospel, According to Kendrick Lamar. Um, it's something that, to me, highlights some of the Christian teaching um, in terms of this labor and rest, um, but obviously points to the secular audience that Kendrick holds um, and the way that he speaks to these same themes. Um, and I thought it was really cool that Vanity Fair picked up on that uh, and chose that title. Um, so rest and joy are two critical pieces not to overlook um, in this work. So what, why does this matter? Um, and I think it matters first and foremost because we must be effective in our advocacy work, not just simply standing on the right side of justice. Standing on the right side of justice, of course, is important, um, even if sometimes it's unclear uh, what the right way forward is. Um, but being on the right side of justice is different than being effective in changing the reality that is causing the injustices to be there. Um, and so the self-care, the practice of bringing our whole selves in, of being genuine, um, helps us to be more effective. And the risk of not doing that are these, I think, in part, the words that are here on the screen. Uh, the risks of not being our whole selves, not being genuine, can lead us to emotional states that can prevent us from being effective. Uh, it can lead to contempt, uh, which is harder than anger. Um, I think anger is actually important 
um, and can be helpful. But when that turns into contempt for another person, that's a very different thing. Um, I think if we're not bringing our whole selves in and practicing self-care, we, we can become uh, uh, discouraged. We can be isolated. We can fall into despair. Um, and I think we may also feel guilty. Um, you know, have we not done enough? Um, are we not doing enough? And I think the question here isn't that. I think it is how do we be more effective? Um, and when we ask that question, it really changes how we treat ourselves and how we approach this work. So what's the reward? To me, the reward of are we being effective? How are we bringing our whole selves in? The reward in includes a boost in energy, a boost in confidence and focus and attention. I think it, it, it can lead to camaraderie and relationship, uh, not just among our peers and our friends, uh, but even with government officials in the course of doing advocacy. Um, and I think it can improve our chances to achieve something together. Um, so this is, you know, the overall approach toward self-care and how I see it intersecting with advocacy. Um, and so turning a little bit into the details of policy advocacy itself, uh, I want to emphasize why self-care is important um, and transition into strategies for effective advocacy. So here are a couple of policy areas, if you will, that one could be working on in Haiti. I imagine some of you are studying them, um, recognizing some names here uh, in the group. Uh, I know some of you work in these areas. Um, some of you may be focused on the environment, um, others on governance and political transition, um, others on immigration issues. You know, there are a number of policy areas that are sort of larger um, but each have their own nuances and own detail. You could get into more detail here. Any one of these particular angles working within advocacy just on Haiti, you know, could be full-time jobs for some of us. They are full-time jobs for some of us, right? So there's an enormous amount of work that could be done, an enormous amount of influence and opportunity as well for us to step into an advocacy space. So perhaps some of you are familiar with working in these spaces, but have not thought about how do we bring this into a conversation with the US government. Um, there are places where you can do that. There are contacts and, and government officials who are focusing on these issue areas uh, in ways that may impact Haiti directly or indirectly. Um, and so in that chaotic environment, it can feel overwhelming. Um, there's so much to be done. Um, another point of, of sort of feeling overwhelmed is just this, this environment within the US Congress. So in the previous congressional session uh, with the US Congress, that was uh, 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 congressional sessions are two years, uh, there were 16,601 pieces of legislation introduced. That's an enormous amount of text and material, um, but even with all of that, only 11% of them even received a vote. And then of those, only 323 were enacted into law over the course of two years. And we're seeing you know, this pattern repeat itself again in the current congressional session. Um, it's something that's not new, um, but it can be intimidating to sift through all of this. And I think one of the key ways to work through this is to work in, in collaboration with others. Um, that's something that the Haiti Advocacy Working Group tries to do. We try to connect people uh, in ways that can help direct conversation in more effective ways. Um, for somebody who may be less informed in a particular issue area, to find somebody who is and connect them and let them join forces together. Um, and so keep that in mind that in the midst of the, the different ways you can approach Haiti, in the midst of this congressional, you know, legislative landscape, there are uh, ways to simplify that and make that more, more manageable. 
So how do we work for justice and preserve self? How do we go through all of that chaotic environment um, and still bring our whole selves into it and not be overwhelmed? So I have three answers to that. The first, I got a bit ahead of myself. The first is use coalitions and partner resources. Um, you don't have to do this alone. Um, find other people who are like-minded with you. Find organizations who are already working on this. Um, one common approach I have found helpful over the last couple of years with the, with the HOG is to find organizations that do direct service very well in Haiti. Um, maybe they focus on um, agriculture work and organizing farmers in particular ways, but they have not seen or don't have the capacity to connect that information and that experience to foreign policymakers in DC. We can help facilitate that. Um, that's something that you can help facilitate yourself um, if you're equipped you know, with the right tools and, and, and perspective to do it. Um, the second answer to how, how do we work for justice while also preserving self is to sharpen our perspective on what self-care can mean. Um, and, uh, you know, in self-care, I think um, we get confused sometimes that it's, it's yoga, it's having candles, it's a treat you know, treating ourselves to a dinner out, those can be pieces of it, certainly. And they can be part of yoga in particular, as an example, can be part of a discipline where we remind ourselves of our person, where we remind ourselves to be whole in this work. Um, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. Self-care is also about making those strategic connections, not reinventing the wheel, um, remembering that we're not in this alone um, and seeking partners to, to join us in the effort. Um, and I also, again, want to reiterate too, that for, for some of us um, and for others, a form of self-care is actually carrying out advocacy. Um, a form of self-care may be joining a protest. Uh, a form of self-care may be, you know, going above and beyond and trying to have, a, you know, a, a, as many congressional meetings as we can. Uh, or connecting to donors for gaining support for work going on in Haiti. All of those can be a part of self-care too, um, but we need to think of it as more holistically. Um, and then think about when self-care is appropriate um, and preserve time for sort of different parts of self-care and don't mix them. Um, I have seen organizations be ineffective when they have strategy meetings for advocacy but they take that time to focus on personal processing, um, to say how, you know, to going into their personal grievances, personal struggle um, in the time when they're supposed to be, or, or, or ideally would be working on advocacy strategy. It is not that that type of work is not important. That type of processing is important, but this goes back to the question I raised earlier of being effective. It's not just about being on the right side, it's about being effective in this work. And so differentiating in our time on when we should be practicing self-care, when we shouldn't be, um, how we think about that can help us to be more effective in this work as well. And then how do we work for justice and preserve self? We can be sharper in the use of advocacy tools. Um, and so this is turning into the, the last segment um, of, of my time with you all before questions. And we think in our office um, of advocacy tools um, as uh, sort of framed around an iceberg. Um, some advocacy tools are public, the ones that are above the water. Um, and those may be tools that you are more familiar with, um, but there's also a lot that can be done uh, below the surface of the water. Um, if you don't know, uh, for icebergs, the vast majority of the size of an iceberg is actually below the surface of the water uh, because of the way uh, buoyancy works in water. And so a lot of that work that's below the surface isn't hidden to be kept away. It's just different. Um, it's different work than what's above. So I wanna talk about these public tools first. You may be more familiar with and have even engaged in letter writing, uh, which is typically done by email now, 
um, or phone calls um, and, and calling members of Congress, uh, calling other government officials. Um, there may be sign-on letters. Um, so the, the Haiti Response Coalition organized a joint statement um, back in July um, centered around uh, governance and, and insecurity issues in Haiti um, and gained over 100 organizational signatures um, to that. That's, that can be an effective way to raise the profile of an issue, to have people and organizations speak out uh, together in solidarity with one another. Um, but you may also look at individual statements. Uh, I know, I would imagine many of you are used to posting your thoughts on social media. Um, that can be effective. Um, it can also be effective to take that a step farther um, and look at, at placing an op-ed or a letter to the editor in your local newspaper. Um, it can also involve you know, educational resources, bringing others into this work um, by informing them why this is important, uh, why they should care, uh, and hopefully bringing them in into this. Um, so there are a lot of public tools. There are others beyond this um, that are public that are very useful. Um, but advocacy can be a lot more than that. So moving below the surface, the things that people often overlook uh, or don't pay as much attention to um, include informing and building relationships uh, with policymakers, actually getting to know the people who are making these decisions. Um, when it comes to Congress, for example, um, that's likely to involve getting to know a staffer that works for the member of Congress. Um, in rare cases, it may, it may involve, you know, the member of Congress themselves. Um, uh, Congressman Levin in Michigan, for example, knows Haiti very well. Some of you may know him. Um, and so he has uh, an expertise on Haiti that is uh, abnormal or unique for Congress. Um, but a lot of members of Congress do not have that level of expertise, but their staff might. And so the relationships that you could build with staffers can be really important. Um, and keeping um, this, the understanding that you can offer expertise, you can provide information um, and sort of quiet diplomacy um, without necessarily going public with different things, that that can still be an effective piece of this. Um, I mentioned and talked about coalitions already. Um, the HOG is an example. The HRC is an example, um, focusing more on uh, direct response in Haiti, but not exclusively. Um, there are other types of coalitions to be a part of as well. Again, some of you may already be a part of them um, and, and, and familiar with them. Um, from an organizational perspective, uh, it can also be helpful to facilitate uh, sort of grassroots and also grass tops advocacy. Um, by grass tops, I would I, I, I mean looking at um, prominent community leaders or the heads of organizations and trying to work behind the scenes to facilitate their relationships with uh, directly with members of Congress at times. We do this in the Episcopal Church where we will connect a bishop of a particular diocese uh, with their members of Congress um, directly. Um, some of them will, are able to carry those relationships on. Um, but that can be a helpful piece of this as well. Other elements, uh, tracking legislation um, can be important. It can be simply useful to see what is being proposed in Congress, what, what might move forward, um, why something is not moving forward. Um, finding bill co-sponsors uh, can be a piece of that. Um, so sometimes uh, um, members of Congress will wait to introduce a piece of legislation until enough of their colleagues have said, I will co-sponsor this when it's introduced. Um, sometimes a bill is introduced without a lot of co-sponsors, but that still can be a piece of the process before it is actually brought up for a vote in the House or, or the Senate. Um, so there's a lot of work that, that can be done in that space um, that's still considered advocacy, um, and it takes really leaning in. Uh, to this work and leaning into that relationship building to do it. Um, part of the result of that relationship building um, can be opportunities to contribute to the drafts of legislation, to actually be a person that helps to write it um, for a congressional office, um, to contribute to internal letters and statements. Um, we were um, invited, uh, as an example, we were invited by Senator Tillis to help contribute to pieces of 
um, uh, of their communications um, with, uh, around Haiti um, in a helpful way. There are opportunities that can come through this relationship building that really can get pen to paper um, in effective ways, um, but again, do not involve sort of the public above the surface work. Um, and so these, all of these tools require a different skill set. They require a different time investment, uh, different resources to pull off. Um, but I, this is sort of a, a summary of all of the advocacy tools that I think are available, uh, that I think are most effective. Um, it's certainly not uh, all that there is, uh, but it, it is hopefully a glimpse at um, what is at your disposal, what is possible for you to get involved in when advocating on Haiti. Um, so the next, I think, at least the next logical question is how do we navigate all of these different tools? How do we know when uh, to, to use which piece? And to me, the most important question to ask ourselves in, in determining what tools to use uh, and what issues to focus on is to ask what is our organization's unique value add or what is my personal value add? Uh, what, does my, what does my lived experience, what does my education bring to this uh, that is unique? Maybe I'm not the only one, but it's really where my expertise is. And in that, in answering that question, you then should look at um, the issue areas um, where you have that value add and go for the more labor intensive tools that have a higher reward. Um, for everything else, use tools that require less time. So from, to walk through an example, um, the Episcopal Church operates one of the nine refugee resettlement agencies um, in the United States. And in that, we can bring a particular expertise to, uh, to Congress, to other government officials on how that process happens, on what the needs are um, for uh, refugee resettlement in the U.S., um, and that's something that because there are only nine such organizations, we can do that, that many other organizations can't. And so we will lean into very methodical, very careful relationship building in particular around refugee resettlement. By contrast, you know, we do, the Episcopal Church does focus on healthcare in some ways, uh, but we really don't necessarily have, you know, a unique voice on what healthcare should look like in the United States. Um, and so we may do social media posts, we may have a quick public statement about a particular piece of legislation related to healthcare, but we may not lean into the detailed labor intensive work, um, you know, that goes on below the surface as much for that issue. Um, of course, it depends, it varies. Um, this is all more like art um, than it is science. Um, but this is, I think, the help, most helpful question to be asking um, and how we sort through these, these issues. And in developing our strategy based around this question, uh, it, it can help us preserve space for self-care, coming back around to that topic. Um, it helps us be more effective um, so that we really lean, we, we rely on uh, what our connections are, uh, what our viewpoints are. Um, and to an extent, you know, leave anything else to, to others who are more informed, to other organizations and other people who do have different value adds than we do. Um, and in that way, we can, we can hopefully coordinate and address, um, you know, advocacy from different angles um, and be effective together. So the last sort of section um, is to transition into a bit more detail, and then I want to open it up to, to questions. Um, so as a part of the advocacy training today, um, I hope that uh, we can stay in touch, um, for those of you who registered for this, that we can stay in touch uh, over the next couple of weeks, and that I can help walk you through taking some advocacy actions, if that's something that interests you. Um, we asked for your home state, um, and for your representative, um, if, you're, if you're living in the U.S., um, to help us group you together um, for messaging um, uh, around Haiti um, and to bring, you know, different perspectives to your congressional delegation um, that you would like to bring. Um, and so in that particular work, um, which would apply to any advocacy that you do, 
um, you really need to hone, hone in on the message um, and what you want to say, um, who, you're, who you are aiming the message to, and how you want to deliver that message. Um, so these are a few more granular tactics um, or tips maybe for advocacy um, that are a bit more detailed than what I've been talking about so far. Um, but remembering those three questions, what is your message? Who are you directing the message to? And how are you delivering that message should guide pretty much any advocacy that you're doing. Um, and in that work, it's important, I think, to focus on one topic at a time, um, even though issues are intersectional. Um, in other words, you know, climate change is impacting agriculture, you know, seasons and growing patterns in Haiti, which can impact food security and, um, and can impact migration patterns. All of these things are true, but often when it comes to policymaking, um, you may be dealing with people who understand that. You may not be, but you may be dealing with people who understand that and who need to get to a more specific level. Um, where it may be unclear how to move forward. Um, be concise in messaging, um, keep messages short, clear. Um, it's often unhelpful in public statements and emails that you send to really get longer than a page. Um, even a page sometimes can be too long, um, but, uh, and, and sometimes that's a struggle. I think it's actually harder to write pieces that are shorter. Um, than it is longer, but it can be important um, so that people actually take time with the message you're delivering. Make sure that you know what the person you're speaking to can do for your issue. Uh, so it does not make sense to, I'll stick with the refugee resettlement example, um, even though it's not directly tied to Haiti, so I don't, I don't comment necessarily on, on, on Haiti itself. Um, but with refugee resettlement, the president of the United States, uh, whoever that is at the time, um, has the ability to determine how many refugees the United States will let in. That is not something that Congress can determine right now, um, the way that it is structured. And so to ask Congress to you know, determine that number of refugees isn't actually the right place to direct that message. There may be a way to say, introduce legislation that requires a certain number of refugees to be to be uh, resettled, uh, but that is slightly different. So knowing what the person you're speaking to can do for your issue is important so that they understand what you're asking and why it's relevant. Um, I've said this before, going through these tips, ask how you can help um, and uh, I'll add, say thank you. Um, do not overlook those steps. Um, they can be so critical for relationship building uh, that can be so critical for setting up uh, another conversation and future engagement. Um, and you, even though there are numerous examples where you know we don't, where government officials do things we are not thankful for, it can be helpful to let them know when we see them doing something we like, when we see them taking an action that we appreciate. Uh, and letting them know that. It can really, really be helpful um, in their own decision-making. It can be helpful in your uh, visibility with those government officials um, and, and can help move those, those relationships along. Um, so again, with this information, I hope that it's helpful um, and gives you a, a, a sense of how to combine self-care with advocacy. Um, again, we will be in touch uh, in the coming weeks um, with you all to see if you're interested in, in sort of working through uh, an advocacy action, an advocacy ask. Uh, we chose not to organize uh, a single ask that you all would then sort of take forward. Um, that can be a daunting process to get everyone in consensus uh, and in, in agreement with a single ask. Um, but we do have uh, an amazing panel coming up this afternoon, um, and that panel will be sharing not only, you know, information and their perspectives from, from things happening on the ground in Haiti um, and with immigration, um, uh, hopefully, but that information can be useful for determining what message you want to bring to elected officials. It can equip you with particular perspectives uh, to amplify. Um, and bring in. So in, in a way, I hope that this sets you up for 
hearing this panel in a different way um, than you might have than you might have otherwise. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Um, and I wanted to leave enough time for questions um, to see how um, how I can help guide you, how I can help address things I did not cover. Thank you for that, Alan. Um, I know my colleagues in HSA were not shy, so um, please ask Alan some questions. He's here to uh, give us the tools necessary to create those new narratives. I have a question. This is Joy Davis. Can you hear me okay? Hello there. I am very interested in ways that myself as well as my colleagues can assist anyway in terms of education, K through 12 in higher education, curriculum, policy, everything about it is my specialty. So I'm wondering if you have any strategies on ways that myself and interested colleagues from St. Louis University might assist in terms of education, whether it's K-12 or higher education. Thanks for that question. Um, and Mark, I'm gonna, I believe there will be a panel as a part of the, comp the conference, HSA conference in the next two days um, that's focused on education itself, not necessarily from like a US government advocacy perspective, um, but from a, a perspective in Haiti on grappling with uh, um, education from the angles you just described, um, K through 12 education in particular, um, from teacher training to curriculum, uh, curriculum development. Um, to the, I, think, I think they'll probably speak to, I, I don't know what their content is exactly, but I think they'll probably speak to languages um, and, the, and the issue of language uh, in the context of Haiti as well. Um, so that's a start, um, otherwise, you know, it's, I don't know, I should know this, I don't know for sure in the appropriations process, which is on ongoing right now um, in the U.S. Congress, if there are any pieces related to education uh, that are directed toward Haiti. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, that's not where I have a value add, I do not have a value add in, in education. Um, but that's something, one place where I would look. Um, how else could I be helpful there? Okay, well, thank Melinda you. Miles, Melinda Miles had sent something in the chat as well about the education working group for the uh, Haiti Response Coalition as well. Uh, and yes. myself put the link in the chat uh, to register uh, the, the program for the conference. Um, here. Thank you for that question, Joy. We had a, a Kantara Sufa ask the question, thank you for your presentation. Can you provide a few examples uh, of how to begin making connections with policymakers? Sure, that's, uh, with foreign policy, it most often deals with federal level officials in the US government. Um, so that mean, I mean, there may be elements of, it, of this for a state legislature, uh, but you're already narrowing it down considerably just by focusing on the federal government. Um, and so I think part of the, to begin making those connections, um, one key way for Congress um, is to look at when Congress is on a recess, um, meaning they're not in legislative session in DC, um, because many members will then hold town hall events, uh, sometimes they're different names, but they'll hold town hall events within their home state or home district. Um, those have looked different, both because of COVID precautions um, and security threats, unfortunately, um, against members of Congress. So they have really shifted how they have done those, but that can be a chance if you do not live in the DC area uh, to connect more directly. Um, as as a, an aside, um, to emphasize, you know, that as an opportunity, there was a, um, a, an Episcopal priest um, that I know in, um, in South Carolina, she heard that her representative in Congress was going to be at a coffee shop. He had set aside an hour 
publicized it, said, please come by, you know, ask, ask me questions. Uh, and the priest was running late. Um, and so she thought, well, I can at least hear, you know, the last 40 minutes. Um, I can listen to what other people ask, um, even if I don't get to ask my question. Uh, and when she showed up, she was the only person there. Um, so she actually had 40 minutes with her member of Congress, uh, which is incredibly unique. Um, but I raised that to really emphasize that, like, sometimes there are not as many people as we think there are reaching out. Um, so town halls and, and in-district events, um, there are ways to just contact the office blindly through email uh, and phone calls. Um, each member of Congress should have that contact information on their website. Um, and, you know, you may, it may be slow to get traction if you're wanting to do relationship building. Um, but one way to do so, especially if you're connected to an organization, is to request a meeting with a, a staff person in their office. Um, and so to say, you know, I'm working in uh, food insecurity and agriculture in Haiti. This is what I would like to see in the farm bill. Uh, I would love to speak to your staffer who focuses on this issue. Can we set up a meeting for next week um, and kind of get a ball rolling that way um, so that it's a bit more formal. Um, you're showing uh, an investment um, in that relationship building. Um, that can be a piece of it too, um, in addition to just, you know, joining sort of mass letter sending, mass phone calls, that can be effective as well. It's just different. So those are a couple of examples. There, there are many others. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. My name is uh, Jesse of Cadet Legos, and there are many of us in the Haitian community that have been for, fighting for years around Haiti, 40 and sometime even 50 years. And I think that the time now are tougher than ever uh, because in the 80s, the 90s, you had other countries that were struggling uh, in Latin America fighting for liberation. And with the exposure, I think in America of what a lot of people are grappling with, we get a sense that the situation becomes tougher and more ho a, a hopeless. And I, I'm seeing that a lot of Haitians are getting tired and at time turning against each other, blaming each other, blaming the diaspora for not doing enough for Haiti. So how do you tackle something like that? Because I think that there is potential for burnout and um, you know, misdirection of frustration. Yeah, I mean, great question and, and uh, important dynamic um, to point out. Um, it's, I did not necessarily cover that. I mean, which is why you're asking the question, did not necessarily cover that in this, because it's not a direct advocacy tool, um, but a part of my work with the Episcopal Church um, has been uh, developing a civil discourse curriculum um, and then implementing civil discourse trainings around the church to help improve how we talk to one another. Um, there are, I think, some dynamics that are, are different um, between, you know, Haitians in Haiti and the Haitian diaspora community versus the U.S. population overall, uh, which is generally who I focus on uh, with dialogue programs, but um, there's still a lot of commonality. And so I think it's important for, to take a step back, it feels like, it feels maybe like moving backwards, uh, but I think it's important to pause and really examine how we talk to one another about really difficult issues uh, because we are not very effective at doing that. Um, as you just said, um, it can become mean um, and dangerous uh, at times. But if we step back and really work on our engagement with one another, we're going to be more effective at creating a space where dialogue can happen. Um, and I think in that space, 
we hopefully can see that disagreement is not a burden. It can actually be an asset to this work. Um, I think if, if anyone involved knew the right way forward for Haiti, we would be on that path. Um, the reality is, is that we don't have that. We've got to work together, taking in all of her different perspectives um, on the challenges that we're facing um, and figure out how to problem solve with that, um, to bring that information together. Uh, and we just really, I think, again, US overall, um, I've seen, I'm not as connected to the Haitian diaspora community um, as others, but from what I've seen, there are just, there's so few spaces where that can happen. And I think we've got to really take a step back and make sure we have that space. Um, we have that space for respectful conversation. We have that space to bring our full selves in um, with humility, uh, with the curiosity that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and again, at the beginning with a recognition uh, that politics impacts people. I think we know this um, and we draw our passion from that. Um, some of us know that we, we, we were so passionate about something because we know how it impacts ourselves or we know how it impacts somebody that we, cares, that we care about. Others are coming in with that same approach. Um, and to have a space where we can talk through that constructively, it helps us to understand that and not let that you know, turn us into to enemies. Um, that's a really soft answer. That's not a very specific answer, um, but I think it really it's critical that we try to, we aim for making those spaces uh, and examine how we talk to one another. It's not easy. A uh, board member and uh, candidate for vice president of HSA is monitoring our chat. So she'll be uh, reading uh, next question. Thank you, Mark. Bonsoir tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Uh, so the next question, I think there are more comments um, than anything else. So someone say uh, to stay engaged during election campaign season and um, uh, somebody else say I think I don't know if I'm missing anything, but if people can use the ways, uh, function to raise their hands if they have questions and Mark, if you could double check to make sure I'm not missing any questions in the chat as well. And Lois Wilkin had asked about, uh, my organization does Haitian performing arts. How can we connect and how can we help? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, the one, a couple of drawbacks um, that I struggle with with advocacy is it can be boring um, and it's not very visual. Um, you know, we, I, I am in Zoom meetings all the time, you know, exchanging emails, you know, there's nothing really flashy about that, um, which, you know, is part of the work. Um, and again, is, is just different than sort of the, the protest activism type elements that can be so complementary to this. Um, so that that's where my mind goes in hearing that, that question um, at first. But I think there are ways to, there's so many people who aren't necessarily convinced that this is worthwhile. Um, they don't, they may be discouraged, they may simply not know how to in, be involved. They may not be aware of who to connect to. And I think there are ways that we can energize people um, using visual arts in that way. Um, and then maybe a different way to answer that question. Um, I mean, there, I'm so appreciative. And I mean, Haiti, if, I think as we all know, probably know is such a, so good at this collectively. There's so much behind art, whether that's performance or, and, and dance or you know, uh, painting and, and sculpture work. Um, there's so much thought that goes into that and a lot of expression of particular groups, especially those who are the most marginalized. And so I could see you know, using networks and connections, uh, your personal experiences in those spaces, 
um, to bring those voices more into the fold and, and advocacy, because um, it's so critical um, to bring those voices in, um, and especially to lean into creating spaces for those voices and advocacy rather than simply speaking for them. Um, and I think, so I, I think there's absolutely, there are direct connections there uh, in a number of ways. Um, to the election comment, um, certainly, I mean, in, from the perspective of the Episcopal Church, uh, as, a, as a nonprofit, um, our voter engagement work is nonpartisan. Um, that means we do not or, and cannot encourage um, uh, uh, people to vote for or not vote for a particular candidate um, or a particular political party. Um, but there's a lot of voter engagement work that we can still do. Um, make sure people are registered and know how to register. Uh, make sure they know where to vote. Um, make sure they encourage others to vote. Um, they're also are ways that nonprofits can still organize candidate forums. Um, as essentially, this is not legal advice, um, but essentially nonprofits, if they extend equal uh, effort into inviting all candidates of a particular race, they can hold a forum with those candidates. Um, if a candidate does not show up or respond to those invitations, that's on them. Um, and you can have a conversation about Haiti with those political candidates. Um, there also, of course, are a lot of ways to get involved with get out the vote efforts that are partisan. Um, you can run for office, uh, that's one thing. Um, but if that is intimidating um, to you like it is to me, um, you can help, you can work for a campaign, you can work for uh, you know, a local um, a political party office um, to get behind a candidate and support them in that way. Um, that just can't be done cannot be done in the context of a nonprofit. Thank you, Alan. The next speaker, like right next, inspires a lot of us to get out and run for office. So let's let's save that for when uh, Representative Pred <laughs> Cecile, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, there's another question, Alan. It says, has the Episcopal Church in Haiti considered developing expertise in community dispute resolution? To my knowledge, no. Um, I would love to see that happen. Um, I feel, I mean, in the context of my current job role with the Episcopal Church, that's a probably outside of that scope. But that said, you know, I, it, it's a personal curiosity of mine to see how I can bring, how I can merge my understanding of, of Haiti, um, Haitian culture, Haitian history and politics, how I can merge that with my expertise in, in dialogue facilitation. Um, I haven't explored how to apply that tangibly, um, but would, would like to. Um, and in terms of the, the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti, I don't know that they've done anything like that themselves, um, but there could be something that I'm not aware of, or maybe even something at a in a particular parish or a particular town um, where they have focused on that. Thank you. Um, another question says, do you have advice or insights on building advocacy movements amongst a group that comes together around shared interests that are not political advocacy? For example, Episcopalians or Haitian studies. How do you create alignments in subgroups that leverage the breadth of the membership, but also are able to focus and move forward with their various strengths and interests? So it's a two-part question. And I think sure. you, you were able to read it in the chat as well, right? Yes, the it's, okay. it's slow enough. I appreciate you reading it. I think that, <laughs> okay. that's helpful. Um, the chat's slow enough. I've, I've kept up, I think. Um, you know, the, that's a question I get very frequently um, within in doing these trainings uh, with Episcopal churches um, because people are often more comfortable with what I call tangible work or direct service work, um, but not with being political. Uh, and one of the most successful ways I have seen people introduce advocacy um, is to look at the work they're already doing 
reflect on what are the goals of that work? Why are we doing this? Um, you know, why do we have a, why are we supporting a school in Gomorn? Or why are we, why do we have an agriculture program in uh, Capaicien? Um, and then ask, how can we pursue those same goals through advocacy? Uh, not as a replacement, but as something that is complementary to it. Um, and so that's where I think it, it's so, and, and to an extent, in contrast with activism, advocacy is different because it focuses on relationship building and it focuses on bringing our expertise in. Uh, so being political, it involves saying vote yes, vote no on this bill, but it also involves bringing in our expertise and our perspectives into collaboration, collaborative environments with government officials. Um, that's being political, um, but it's different, I think, than what many folks often think of. Um, creating subgroups, you know, that, if you figure that out, let me know. Um, I have struggled to keep subgroups going um, in the hog as an example. Um, and one of the challenges would be intersectionality between issues. So you look at um, agriculture, you could spin that into the environment, you could spin that into uh, resource extraction and mining, you could extend that, spin that into uh, private property um, and, and land grabbing. There are all sorts of different angles uh, or ways you could group uh, people and interests. Uh, but I think, you know, ultimately, I go back to creating that space for conversation. Um, and that's one of my personal desires for the hog is to be that space where we don't necessarily have consensus um, and then act as a working group, but we help facilitate conversations and we support the work that each organization is doing um, to the extent that we can. Um, thank you. There are two hands raised, um, marie Jose and um, Senzi. Uh, hi, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for this presentation. I have a question, but uh, I'm not too sure if it falls in the area of advocacy, but it is something that has to do with uh, building trust among uh, groups and uh, bringing groups together to have a national impact uh, on the, yeah, to have a national impact. If I would like, my first question would be that, is that part of advocacy? Or, and if it is, uh, what would be, I, I, I heard that you, in your comments, you, you more or less touch to it, this kind of activity. I think uh, we lost you, Marie Jose. But I think uh, are, are you able? Maybe you can ask your questions in the chat, Marie Jose. But I to know what can be done. Maybe a strategy to try in their corner, so to speak. Um, Thank you. I, I can. I can. Yeah, I can. If you get it, respond, Yeah, I okay, think I can. Thank can you. respond to the gist. Okay. You know. Um, the coalition building piece, um, which you know you could describe um, as connecting to other organizations, working with other organizations, um, is also an art um, rather than a science. Um, but one of the key things I think to keep in mind um, is is to not overlook unlikely allies who may be who may have an interest or a stake and what you want to speak out on and reach out to them. Um, it's also, uh, and that may be in the, the nonprofit sector, that may be in the for-profit sector. Um, there's nothing that says you can't work with, uh, with for-profit um, you know, companies um, and, and, and for-profit entities. Uh, another piece is to not, to not let areas of disagreement prevent you from working with another organization. Um, so in the using examples from my experience, you know, in the Episcopal Church, we have worked um, extensively on um, uh, with the Southern Baptist Convention, with the National Association of Evangelicals, 
um, with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops on areas where we do have agreement, um, areas of climate change, immigration, uh, criminal justice reform, um, but we don't work with them on LGBT rights, for example. The Episcopal Church has a very different perspective on LGBT rights or, or, or different priority um, than those other, other churches. Um, but we don't let that prevent us from working together with them when it makes sense. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind with this and can be a part of building trust um, so that you're not excluding someone because you don't agree on two things, um, but inviting work and collaboration because you do agree on a third thing. Um, and that can be a part of that relationship building. Um, that takes time as well, like any of this work, um, but those are probably my big, biggest pieces of advice there. Thank you, Ale. Uh, Senzi? Thank you so much. And thank you for this this program. Thank you for your words, Alan. I don't have a question as much as I have a comment. A bit earlier, uh, I think it was Jesse Cadet Legros was talking about the 40 years of advocacy being done by the Haitian people. Um, and I'm a, I'm a student of advocacy and I am, I'm just so grateful for all that work that was done. And I appreciate the advocacy that was done to bring our representatives and our senators in Congress to this level where they are hearing um, and where they are joining in the work in so many ways. So I hope that, that um, I hope that I, I know, I understand burnout and I understand the frustrations of it, but I hope that you understand how much you have made this work possible for new advocates and students of advocacy like myself. So for myself, I just want to thank you for all that work. Wonderful, Sandy. It's really good and encouraging. And that certainly will be a booster for me to keep on going. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure I'm not missing um, any hands because as you know, there's over 60 people. So I scroll through, but um, if I'm missing anyone, please let me know. I want to make sure I honor your time and your questions or comments. Anyone else, questions or comments? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat and I, I'm not seeing any hands raised either. There are a couple of other pieces that um, I just got word from Mark that um, the Congresswoman is running a little bit late, um, very common uh, when, when getting a member of Congress in um, for, for an engagement or a meeting. Um, but a couple of things that I left out um, regarding U.S. government, you know, advocacy, which has been, um, you know, my focus and, and, and sort of aim, um, not just in my work with the Episcopal Church, but in this presentation, uh, is there are ways to leverage the U.S. government or advocate to the U.S. government to put pressure on other entities? Um, so advocacy could certainly be applied to um, international financial financial institutions like the World Bank, um, the IMF, um, uh, even the UN. Um, it's not an IFI necessarily. Um, advocacy can be done directly there, but there are also ways that the United States has influence um, over those bodies. Um, and so, you know, advocating to the right U.S. government officials uh, to direct the right messaging. Um, to try to have the right influence over those, those entities can be another helpful angle to this. Um, advocacy can also be critical um, regionally. Um, I'm sure this is not, you know, a, a, a lot of advocacy is not necessarily rocket science. It's just, it's patience and persistence. Um, but to think of advocacy regionally as well, um, Haiti is not, uh, it's literally not an island uh, on its own. Um, but even with the Caribbean region, um, there are dynamics that impact that whole area um, and ways to advocate together with other groups outside of Haiti um, to the US government. So finding places of common interest with the Dominican Republic, um, with uh, the Caribbean basin at large can be helpful. 
um, and helping to inform um, the messaging and the work you know, that we want to be doing in terms of advocating on, on foreign policy to Haiti. Um, so keep those, those dynamics in mind as well um, as, as, you're, as you're going through this work. Um, Mark, do you have, is there anything that you hoped that I would cover today, knowing you had not you hadn't heard me do my my presentation. Is there anything you hope that I would cover that I didn't get to? Oh wow! Um, no, <laughs> um, I was as someone who's had a little bit of experience going to Washington. I could use some tips on you know how to make your presentation. You know, like uh, you talked about establishing relationships and you know the work that we're doing as membership based organizations you know, that more people hear from us uh, that you know the fact that Haiti can get you know advocates like members of, of our organizations to contact their their representatives is, is very important that we can't just rely on the you know the top down advocacy strategies but what tips um, should those of us especially scholars who are used to writing you know 8000 word articles or books or whatever like when any like stock tips that you would give us to make our first uh, pitch or one-on-one meetings with our representatives. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you mentioned the, the 8,000 word articles, you know, reiterating again, the point of being concise. Um, I know that it can be hard to do that. It can be hard to let some things go, but when you, when you're thinking about communication as long-term, um, it doesn't just have to be a one-time thing that can help, I think, um, consolidate and, and, and make your message shorter. Um, because the point, one of the main objectives isn't to make sure somebody's going to read 8,000 words. The objective is to have a good conversation, um, to deliver the key point, hopefully have it, you know, have that point well received, um, but really to start a, a conversation that's long-term. That's the objective. Um, and so, those 8,000 word papers can be a part of the credibility that you bring in. Um, it can be a part of the experience that you bring in, um, but it doesn't have to be that initial message. Um, a second thing is, is to realize that you're interacting with a human. Um, even if it's somebody ahead of time, you kind of suspect will disagree with you um, or a member of Congress you know disagrees with you, um, still pursue those meetings and relationships. Um, still send the you know letters and emails or make the phone calls uh, because it can be helpful um, just to raise you know that that profile. Um, but remembering that it's it's you're dealing with a person um, can be helpful. Um, it's also true with congressional offices in particular that a lot of their staff you know they recognize you as a constituent um, and. Uh, you know, hopefully want to, to woo your, your vote and support as a constituent. And so there's a, a bit of like customer service that they'll bring into it, or, or at least most of them will. Um, so if you're intimidated about going into these types of meetings or engagements, um, keep that in mind too. They're actually wanting to hear from you um, and wanting to hear from you in, in a welcoming way. Um, I find Zoom calls and emails to be harder for being in, inter, um, for being personal in these meetings, um, it was much easier going to an office in person, in DC or in a district office, uh, because you could see, you know, what was important to that member of Congress in their office. Um, I went to a, a member of Congress in Virginia, um, went to their office you know, pre-COVID for a meeting, and they had these um, Virginia peanuts. Virginia produces a lot of peanuts. Uh, they had packets of them, um, and I remembered my mom buying that same brand of Virginia peanuts when I was little, and I would always be excited to have those peanuts. And so they had, you know, samples out that, that visitors could take, um, and I just started laughing when I saw them, and the whole sort of office turned and, and you know, wondered why, why I was laughing, and I shared that story, and it, it had nothing to do with, I don't even remember what the advocacy point was. I was there to speak about, but it helped to make those that, that relationship happen, right? They were like, yes, we love our peanuts. You know, please take these. That's so great. I'm glad, you know, we had uh, uh, the Virginia was contributing to, you know, your childhood in the form of these peanuts. Uh, that sounds silly, um, but I raise that again to emphasize, make these personal. Um, just as I talked about bringing our whole selves into this, uh, government officials 
if they're good, they bring their whole selves into their work too. Um, and so meeting them there can be, can be helpful. Thank you, Ale. I think I see a question from um, Claudine. Uh, she said, Ale, we are waiting for Representative Presley. We will listen to her, but do you have any advice about how to best use this particular time with HSA? Sure, that's a good question. Um, so with Presley, um, she's a, a member of Congress that is, is friendly, so to speak. Um, she you know, helped um, start, then she may join at any moment. Um, hopefully I don't get caught talking about her, um, but it's positive. So you know, she helped start the Haiti caucus. Um, we know in general, you know, she's in line with some of what we have been advocating for um, and as different members of the hog at least. Um, so she's got an understanding and an interest in Haiti already. Uh, so that's starting out, uh, we're starting out ahead. Um, so I think it can be helpful going back to the relationship piece to focus on asking how advocates can be helpful for her. Um, what, where does she see, you know, energy and attention in Congress? Um, what, what, is, what are they focusing on? Um, and, and getting that type of information from her. Um, Asking her some of the same questions. I mean, I, I am not the only perspective by any means on effective advocacy. So if you have a chance asking, how can advocates be effective in contacting her office as an example um, and see what, she, see what she says to that. And there she is, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, sorry, just that can confirmation. Thank you all for your great questions. And thank you, Alan, again, for the presentation. Um, Representative Ayanna Presley is here. I am going to do a brief introduction. Give me one second while I multitask. Um, so you can find her information here. Um, oh, okay, it's not working. I am not millennial, alas, um, so. Uh, Anyway, so I will submit a link in the chat. Uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley is an activist, a legislator, a survivor, and the first woman of color to be elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Throughout her career as a public servant, Congresswoman Presley has fought to ensure that those closest to the pain are closest to the power, driving and informing policymaking. Like many in her district, Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, Cong Congresswoman Presley has endured numerous hardships throughout her life hardships that continue to fuel her commitment to creating robust and informed policies that speak to the intersectionality of her district's lived experience. In 2009, she launched the historic at-large campaign for Boston City Council and won, becoming the first woman of color elected to the council in its 100-year history. While on the council, Congresswoman Presley worked in partnership with residents, advocates, and other elected officials to combat the inequities and disparities facing the community. Throughout her first term in Congress, Congresswoman Presley has been a champion for justice, reproductive justice, justice for immigrants, consumer justice, justice for aging Americans, justice for workers, justice for survivors of sexual violence, and justice for the formerly and currently incarcerated. Currently, Congresswoman Presley serves on two powerful congressional committees, the House Committee on Oversight and Reform and the House Committee on Financial Services, both of which have remained focused on legislatively addressing issues of care, concern, and consequence to the American people. And she is also a co-founder and co-chair of the Haiti Caucus. Very, very excited. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us. And I'm thrilled that, that you're sharing the stage with us. So please take it away. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you uh, for your patience and in advance for your co cooperation moving forward. Um, I am uh, currently in the Democratic cloakroom right off of the floor of the US House of Representatives. And uh, uh, we will be uh, also watching for activity in the event that I need to move suddenly. Um, but first I wanna thank um, uh, Professor Regine Jean-Charles, um, who is the common denominator for uh, many of the most effective uh, justice seekers that I know. Uh, and so I wanna thank her for the invitation to join you today. And I so appreciate um, your efforts, your mobilization efforts um, coming together on this, this critically important advocacy day. And of course, thank you to the Haitian Studies Association 
uh, for inviting me to sit at this virtual table with all of you. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your very demanding and busy um, you know, lives to participate in this workshop. Again, thank you for, for giving a damn. Um, you know, uh, Haitian lives are black lives and black lives matter. So I thank you for your commitment to growing and strengthening your advocacy efforts and um, more than allyship, your intentional uh, uh, willingness to um, be deliberate co-conspirators uh, in the work of justice and centering the humanity of the people of Haiti. Your voices, your expertise and your lived experiences are absolutely critical in this moment as we continue to fight to center the needs of the Haitian people and our US foreign policy here and abroad and to demand a compassionate response and a humanitarian response to what is truly a humanitarian crisis. From the recent heinous abuse of Haitian migrants by CBP officers, I think emblematic of systemic abuse and um, what I would consider the actions of a racist and rogue agency, um, to the political and social instability, to the ongoing deadly pandemic, the trauma and um, the simultaneous crises is just devastating. Um, you know, in all things, I want to lift up and center the Haitian families in my district, the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, which is the third largest uh, concentration of the Haitian diaspora in the nation. Um, you know, I've been spending time in community, uh, you know, as I always have, um, given the how many uh, members of the community um, do represent the Haitian diaspora, you know, long before um, the pandemic or the assassination. Um, and so I continue to do that. And so my heart is with uh, the Haitian families that continue to find themselves in danger on the island. And of course, my heart is with my constituents in the Massachusetts Seven who fear for the safety of their loved ones in the midst of uh, this ongoing turmoil. You know, um, as I said at the top, Haitian lives are black lives and black lives matter. And I wanna underscore that because as I've said so many times about uh, uh, the people of Haiti, um, you know, the work that I do in pursuit of the liberation of, of Black people and all marginalized people, uh, the people of Haiti, uh, gave us the, the blueprint of resistance. Um, and so I, I am indebted to them uh, for that lesson and intend to practice those very same principles on their behalf until we have a foreign policy that isn't rooted in colonialism and um, that we have a uh, political and economic recovery that is um, led by civil society. Um, that's critical to the democracy and also to the recovery. The Haiti caucus, again, we never could have predicted the consecutive uh, crises that would occur, but it was a caucus that had been dissolved. And myself and uh, Congressman Andy Levin, Congresswoman Val Demings, uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark, all who represent uh, large constituencies of the Haitian diaspora uh, resurrected this caucus. Again, not knowing uh, what was on the horizon. So the resurrection of that caucus was certainly timely and um, it has given us um, you know, leverage in our, in our advocacy. And so over the last several months, we've been able to push the administration to support Haiti's COVID response through the deployment of more than 500,000 life-saving vaccines. Um, as of October 1st, there have been more than 70,000 Moderna vaccines administered across Haiti. And of course, we continue to push for more to meet the scale of the crisis. Again, forming the Haiti caucus taught us um, a timely lesson that when we stand together, we can achieve more. And that was the whole point was to have an organized effort within caucus, within the Congress rather, um, to, to make us more effective in our advocacy. So it's really been instrumental in helping us work together across offices and across districts to push the Biden administration on their foreign policy towards Haiti to support and uplift the needs of the Haitian diaspora and to continue fighting for more humane immigration policies towards Haitian refugees and asylum seekers. Um, we know the, uh, the treatment has always been uh, disparate for black and brown uh, migrants. Um, you know, no different than, you know, every other policy. The burden is always greater bore um, by the most marginalized, uh, especially when they are black and brown. So uh, we welcome the partnership of, of anyone 
um, who again wants to learn from the mistakes of the past and get us to a place of just foreign policy that is not rooted in colonialism and one that puts the needs and the aspiration of the Haitian people first. So um, we you know, continue to fight from again, more humane immigration policies towards Haitian refugees and asylum seekers. The caucus, as I said, will anyone who, who wants to uh, learn from the mistakes of the past and uplift the people of Haiti, the caucus is open to all members of Congress. You know, again, anyone who wants to pursue a just foreign policy that puts the needs, and, and I wanna uplift this too, the aspirations of the Haitian people first. So through this collective, we've been able to convene Haitian civil society leaders and coordinate legislative actions together uh, it has certainly made our advocacy in Congress that much more effective and stronger. And I hope and believe that it will play a critical role in forging a new path for our country's relationship with Haiti. Um, and so I'll stop there. And I'm happy to share what I've learned through my work with the caucus and say, <coughs> pardon me, asthma, uh, and to answer any of your questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you really. Thank you so much for all your work uh, and you know, your example of, of fierce dedication to, to justice and seeing the connections uh, that um, what the world needs now. Uh, what do you need from us um, constituents, uh, you know, people who are not elected officials? What, you know, how do we, I imagine there's a lot of competing priorities in Washington. How can we make sure that our concerns about Haiti are given top priority and actually addressed? Well, you know, I think oftentimes, and I'll say this, especially being in a Massachusetts delegation, which, you know, um, it's fair that people would say, okay, we're in a blue state and make assumptions about, you know, where people fall um, and what their opinions might be. I think it's really important um, to call the question. Um, don't make assumptions, you know, um, actively ask your member of Congress. And, um, you know, we have you know, we're regularly sending letters uh, to the White House or initiating legislative responses or, um, you know, fighting for more uh, humanitarian relief and greater oversight and transparency about where that relief is actually going. And, you know, at any given time, you know, there are some 12,000 at least active bills in Congress. Um, you know, there are so many uh, things that we're managing um, we're in a fight right now, you know, for the integrity of our, our very democracy, um, you know, dealing with uh, negotiations um, on physical and, and social infrastructure. So I, I, I just say all that to say that it, unless you put it on their radar, um, it is possible that it is not on their radar. And so I want to encourage all of you to, you know, intentionally and actively seek out each of your members of Congress. Um, ask them to join the House Haiti Caucus. You don't need a foreign policy committee or, uh, or a large Haitian constituency to play a role in providing justice and opportunity uh, for the Haitian people. And I don't think that we should let anyone off the hook um, because the, the pattern of uh, injustice that we see, the rogue and racist um, disparate treatment, the unjust deportations, which we had been uh, fighting against uh, for the last six months. We need as many voices amplifying the urgency of this as possible. And so, um, yes, the number one thing I'll ask of you is to contact your member of Congress wherever you live, call them, email them, write to them, but make sure that you're urging them to pay attention uh, to Haiti. Uh, again, without a doubt, each of you has a crucial role to play in our joint struggle to meet the needs of the Haitian people. Um, and I, I'm really, you know, calling on uh, my own home community, the African American community, uh, to be more intentional in our movement building. Again, Haitian lives are Black lives, and if Black lives are really matter, and we have much work to do to make that so, it is about us codifying the value of uh, Black lives in our budgets um in our investments uh, and in our policies and that is uh the work of black liberation and that struggle is global and so however we can continue to highlight that intersectionality i think is important so just continue to organize um within your your circle of influence and friends about how you can make them a part of this movement what i always want my my constituents, many of whom who represent the Haitian diaspora to know, is that even though the headlines might fade, 
that, you know, my conviction and my commitment to them has not waned. And, you know, right now I remain squarely focused on how we support those um, who are now in Massachusetts and making sure that they have the resources that they need. Um, in terms of what you can be calling for, obviously we need to repeal Title 42. Um, this is something that was weaponized under the Trump administration. And the more voices in this fight, the better. Um, we should not be having any sort of holdovers <clears throat> uh, from the harm caused by that administration. And so please help us to keep the conversation in the media and on the forefront, you know, lifting your voices, your expertise through letters to the editor can also be helpful. So it's not just about what you're amplifying on social, but these unjust deportations must stop. Um, Title 42 uh, must be repealed. The a social, political, and economic recovery of Haiti must be led by civil society. And, and we must um, you know, make sure that um, we are adequately resourcing um, those uh, states and municipalities uh, and, and welcoming the people of Haiti <clears throat> with the trauma supports that they need, uh, the housing that they need, uh, the health care that they need. So those are just some of the issues top of mind since this is not a conversation of also about um, you know, family uh, reunification or uh, TPS and humanitarian parole. I mean, again, there's just so many issues. Um, so reach out to your member and just keep organizing and applying pressure. Thank you. Uh, how much longer are you able to? Spend? I have a couple. Of, I have a couple of more minutes, and I did also just want to say that, um, you know, I serve uh, in addition to co-chairing the uh, Haiti Caucus. I serve on on two two committees: um, the Financial Services Committee, and the other is Oversight and Reform. And so, uh, that committee's job is to conduct oversight of um, all of our agencies of the you know, administration, um, uh, wherever there are abuses. And so I've been pushing for a thorough hearing in the House Oversight Committee regarding the treatment of uh, Haitian migrants at the border to further demand accountability and answers. Um, we can't just sort of you know, shake our heads and say, okay, that's more of the same. Um, in order for there to be a deterrent from these sort of racist, uh, egregious human rights violations, uh, there has to be accountability. Um, and so I remain in communication with the Biden administration, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, and again, in my capacity of the House Oversight Committee, uh, pushing for a thorough investigation. And so, um, you know, we've been told that that's underway, um, but I, I want a brief, I want more than a briefing, um, I want a hearing. Uh, and so just know that that's something else that I continue to advocate for. Good afternoon, uh, Congresswoman Presley. My name is Jessica Detlegos, and I greatly appreciate your work and your support for my country. Um, my question to you, or my suggestion, is that Haiti has a population of 11.5 million. So even if 100, 200,000 Haitians migrate and arrive, and we help them here, Ultimately, what needs to be done is that the United States need to change its foreign policy toward Haiti. It's been abusive, it's been egregious, and damn right, unfair and unjust. And my question again to you, how can you impact the policy that the Biden administration, for instance, has set up and had used Kamala Harris to go around and tell people in Latin America that they could not come here, but however, America was going to strengthen their government. In Haiti, we see the opposite. They are supporting the same people who have been destroying the country. So foreign policy has to be the key support that we need to give to my native country. <clears throat> Well, you know, I certainly uh, agree uh, with that. And again, as I said, we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. 
um, which is why early on I was having conversations with the administration as I was fighting for a cease of these unjust deportations for the last six months um, and had similar conversations uh, with the UN, um, with Vice President Harris directly, um, who when I uh, specifically spoke about the, uh, the racist and human rights violations occurring at the southern border of Haitian migrants, um, you know, told her of my, um, I guess, a grievance would be an understatement, but um, expressed that and she was responsive. And um, ultimately I did have an audience with Secretary Mayorkas um, and, and also with um, a special envoy, uh, Daniel Foote. Uh, and again, uh, his resignation uh, was consistent uh, with many of the concerns that we had expressed um, that were corroborated uh, by the reasons behind his departure. Um, and we've used that to say, again, how can we be deporting people to Haiti when swaths of the region are without, elect without power, without uh, clean water? Uh, the region continues to be ravaged um, by the pandemic, um, gang warfare and other violence as evidenced by uh, the most recent kidnappings of these missionaries. Uh, and so it is not only cruel and inhumane, um, but I think in, in many ways it is a death sentence and have said as much. Uh, so I do not serve on the Foreign Relations Committee. I am leveraging my co-chairship on the House Haiti Caucus, which I played a role in resurrecting, um, which has you know, been successful in giving me uh, that leverage directly to the White House. But I think ultimately uh, things only change with pressure. And that's why it's important that as the headlines fade and people are emotionally rubbernecking and moving on to the next thing, when black people around the globe continue to be in peril, experiencing a fire hose of human rights violations and indignities, against the backdrop of a so-called reckoning on racial injustice. And so I'm going to keep uh, the pressure on and I will continue to call out the hypocrisy. Um, I'm appreciative of Plaza's artfully painted Black Lives Matter, um, but uh, the only receipts that matter in this moment are budgets and policies. And I want a foreign policy that uh, codifies the value of black lives around the globe. And so that must include Haitian lives. And again, one that is not rooted in colonialism. Um, so I am using every platform available to me, every tool available to me um, to fight this fight and calling on my home community of black Americans, knowing the debt that we owe to the people of Haiti who taught us the work of resistance uh, and the work of liberation to make sure that we are intentional uh, co-conspirators in this work. So, I, I, you know, look, I just, there's a, an adage that I use often in organizing and that is, um, you know, we will tell your stories and we will lift up these stories in the hope that you will see the light. Uh, and so that's what I do in all things is to, to center the humanity and the dignity of the people of Haiti to uh, talk about the trauma that the people of diaspora are experiencing in my district as they fear for their loved ones. Um, but if you do not see the light, we will bring the fire. And um, I intend to keep my word on that. And we will as well bring the fire if the light is not brought. So thank you very much for that uh, incitation to like the need to stay involved, the need to stay engaged, the need to stay <coughs> active. Um, so, um, I don't know if you have if you have to go back to your vote, or if we have one more question, or you want to just uh, really appreciate, really respectful. Yeah, I, I would love to hear from all of you. You know, while I have a couple of minutes, and I see my my link sister, um, the the brilliant professor that I was. I don't know if you heard me. Um, professor earlier saying that you are the common denominator for many of the most effective justice seekers that I know. What an incredible legacy. Um, you know, some of, again, the most effective people here on the Hill, some of whom I'm biased have been in my own organization. Um, credit you for uh, 
their their policy and um, and grassroots political advocacy. So thank you for laying that foundation. It's an extraordinary legacy. Um, is there anything that, that's on your minds that you all want to make sure that um, I appreciate the sisters saying, you know, do more and just know that, you know, I'll be indefatigable in my efforts. Um, but um, I see a hand raised here. Is it a uh, Merlesna? Oh, you said it right. Okay. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I do want to shout out the other Ayana that's on here somewhere. Sh shout out to the other Ayana. Okay. All right. Uh, Merlesna, um, do you have a statement or a question? Yes. Um, so I would say thank you for representing Massachusetts so well. Um, I'm a product of Massachusetts. That's where I used to live before moving to North Carolina. That's where I'm currently am. And it's been hard to organize or even figure out what to do in a community that looks different than Boston. Um, and so when I'm presented with opportunities to either meet with you or like today, or even figuring out what's next and collaborating with folks here. How do I do that? So for example, my Congress person or my, my state representative is, is not as active or forefront like you. And it's not a shout at anyone else, but it's just, that's not who they are. And so how can I still make sure that they know our voices need to be heard or to collaborate with, with us, the Haitians that are here? Because there are quite a lot of us here in North Carolina. Thank you. Sure. I think it's, um, you know, vigilance and consistency. Um, and um, if you have other people who are of shared purpose in community, uh, making sure that they also are lobbying that elected official. Um, but again, I'm a firm believer that, you know, it's not only people with a comma and a title after their name that can effectuate change or uh, do the work of um, uh, seeking or actualizing justice, you know. So, um, uh, the other thing is you could, uh, talk to my office and, um, or any of the community-based organizations that you've worked with in Massachusetts, um, or other places previously and see if they have a, a local affiliate, you know, where you are now in North Carolina, they might have other partners. Um, and so I like to just go to those organizations who have been the most, consistent in this work. One organization I would suggest is Bridge. Um, I, would, I would look into them. They were really key to making sure the story was being told about uh, what was happening at the Southern border. Um, and, and I like to partner with those organizations that are organizers. You know, not every organization, um, you know, are, are activists, are organizers. And so, um, I would reach out to them and ask them if, if there are any uh, leaders or partners in North Carolina. Um, I know my staff is on here as well, and we will, um, I don't know how to do this. Um, Anib, I don't know, can you get information uh, from Relesna so we can follow up with some specific organizations? I did mention Haitian Bridge and they put a link in there for them. Yeah, okay. I'll drop my email in the chat so everyone can reach out to me after. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and Haitian Bridge Alliance is one of the groups that's going to be at the next pen briefing, uh, along with three other groups, the Commission on, um, for Haitian Solution for the Crisis and uh, Action Aid and, and Radio IT, IT to talk about how these crises of uh, the border, the, the, the political cri the situation of the assassination in the uh, civil society and the earthquake are all connected, so. Um, that's right, that's right. And I see someone here is saying, I'd like to echo Jocelyn's question, what are the biggest or most persistent roadblocks that the caucus faces in Washington? Well, this is being recorded, so I'm not gonna name names, but when you talk to my staff offline, they can elucidate you. Um, but I will say, generally speaking, um, the, the, the biggest roadblocks um, are just that people are so quick to move on. I think they've become very desensitized to the struggles um, of the people of Haiti. They, they've just, they've been, uh, it, 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 all I can say is if you're tired of hearing about it, imagine how tired they are of living it. So um, I think uh, that's the biggest obstacle is that people are, are I think, desensitized. Some of it is um, ignorance. Um, and I, by that, I don't mean malice. I mean, a lack of knowing, you know, um, or just 
you know, how they'll always lift up the resilience of the Haitian people. Who wants to be that resilient? Like, why are we acting like that's some extraordinary badge of honor? It's a resiliency born out of neglect. It's, it's a resiliency born out of colonialism and white supremacy. You know, it's a, it's a resiliency born out of heinous abuses. I don't want that kind of resiliency. So that resiliency um, should not be an excuse for inaction. Oh, look, the professor gave me a yes. So I, I know I'm on the roll today because she's not easily... I'm her girl and she's not easily impressed by me. You should see these text messages she be sending me. Anyway, I do have to get to the floor. I'm just kidding. That, you know, nothing but love, nothing but love over here. All right, y'all. I do have to get going. Um, again, thank you for giving a damn. Uh, thank you for your commitment and your sacrifice. Uh, it's an honor to be in this movement building justice seeking work with you. And please do know that you can call upon myself in my office at any time. And please do see, even if I'm not your Congresswoman, see me as your Congresswoman and see my platforms as your platforms too. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, HSA. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you all for coming. Um, the next panel is in nine minutes. So um, let's hear about how these issues are connected. Um, and Dr. Jean Charles, thank you again for the introduction to um, Representative Presley. Thank you for your leadership as well. So, Napwe, Yon Timoma, Tale. Regine, merci en pile. En pile, en pile, en pile. Oui, merci. Merci pour nous te gagner et venir joindre nous. We're grateful. Je yeah, m'a pour merci en pile tout et uh, parce que je pense que ça et représentant Presley a dit à pour nous capable pour contact avec lui n'importe qui l'heure important parce que ça frustrant pour moi l'homme écrit représentant pas moi yo vague sur Haïti mm. pas réellement intéressé et et situation complexe en pile et m'a pas besoin de dire non parce que nous même qui haïtien l'ami c'est c'est son bagage du qu'il y a pour marcher dit qu'on haïtien et puis qu'embé courageux pour continuer à gommer pour payer ça parce que gars de foi bah il paraît il fait nous en pile la caille il fait nous en pile so en tout cas merci en pile pour conversation ça et me souhaiter que et na continuer toujours et na continuer bah une l'autre courage <laughs>